to the Global Economic Outlook session, uh, which I'm uh, delighted to moderate at a very, very interesting juncture in the world economy. Um, before I set out the issues, um, let me introduce briefly this very distinguished uh, panel, um, since I'm sure you know all the speakers. Um, immediately to my left is uh, Christine Lagarde, the Managing Director of the IMF, and it appears very likely to con continue to be the Managing Director of the IMF <laughs> for several more years, partly because uh, of the enthusiasm of people like her neighbour to her left, uh, George Osborne, the Chancellor of the Exchequer uh, of the United Kingdom, who of course has nominated her for another term. Uh, to his left is Aaron Jaitley, Finance Minister of India, um, uh, uh, certainly the fastest growing large economy in the world. Uh, 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 to his left is Haruiko Kuroda, uh, Governor of the Bank of Japan, and a man engaged in one of the most important and interesting monetary experiments of all time. And finally, to his left, it's Jan Tiam, who's Chief Executive Officer of Credit Suisse AG. Um, so just to introduce it, our discussion where we are now, uh, as you have all surely noticed in the last month, we've had an immense amount of market turbulence um, uh, in exchange markets and in stock markets. The S&P is down to 1,900, but as I recently pointed out, on many measures still pretty highly valued. Oil is, I just looked up in my paper this morning, West Texas International is at 3160, um, still incredibly low. Uh, that's a very significant price uh, adjustment. Um, uh, worth remembering, however, that we are also in an environment still of unbelievably low bond yields, US 10 years at 2.06, German 10 years at 0.49, and the Japanese 10 year at 0.24, which is really staggering. The IMF, looking at the economy, has produced its recent forecasts, and it's perhaps worth mentioning in view of all this turbulence, and I'm sure Christine Lagarde will say more about this, that they expect this year's growth to be higher than last year, 3.4% against 3.1%. If we look at the big issues uh, the, uh, in the world economy, there's the uh, immense adjustment in commodity prices, which is very, very damaging for quite a number of companies and, of course, countries. Brazil and Russia are notable big uh, victims, but it's important to stress there are very important gainers. Uh, China, India represented here are big gainers, and so, of course, is most of Europe. Um, uh, but it, of course, creates huge uh, challenges. Another economic issue of some importance is it does appear very recently that the US is slowing at the same time as the Fed has decided to tighten rates. There's a big concern about a number of financial risks, corporate debt in emerging markets, and of course, debt overhangs in developed market economies remain very large in many countries, private and of course public. It's perhaps worth stressing that we do solve some problems. This year, nobody is obsessed with the possibility, rightly I believe, that the Eurozone is about to fall apart and not much discussion of Grexit. Instead, we now talk about Brexit. So we will have that discussion instead. And Brexit is just one of a number of examples of major political risks or politically uh, uh, driven risks which have economic consequences. Uh, the migration crisis, quote unquote, in, uh, in, uh, in Europe. The fascinating, and to some people, certainly including me, terrifying possibilities in the US presidential election. Uh, the uh, rise of populism everywhere and international relations issues in the Middle East between Russia and Europe remain very, very significant. So these are very turbulent and fascinating times. So in view of this, I've decided we're going to start with a view of what is going on in the markets and how significant it is um, for the economy, 
how worried we should be. So I'm going to start with Tijan Tiam and ask him for his brief reactions on what on earth is going on from the perspective of someone who's actually having to manage it and survive it day by day. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Martin. Um, what on earth is going on? Uh, simply the, the worst start of any year on the record in financial markets ever. Um, simple. So if you got the numbers, it's the worst start we've had uh, three weeks in the year ever. So what's driving that? Maybe I can say a few words about what I, what I think the market believes and then say what we believe. Um, the market is very worried about China, of course. Growth, is tr growth in China, we've seen the 6.9 coming out. The two issues there, the market doesn't necessarily believe the 6.9 the and also believes that there may be a hard landing in China or a very significant decrease in growth. And that has direct implications on uh, through commodities and oil on growth in other parts of the world. So the fear that we're walking into a global recession and also a lot of fears around the oil sector itself, uh, which for the shale gas operators is highly leveraged. And we've seen the, the high yield debt reprice very brutally uh, at the beginning of the year, at the end of, um, of 15 also. Uh, triggering losses in, in portfolios. And you will have, in the background of that, that's really important, also a technical factor, which is massive redemptions, massive outflows from asset managers, some of them driven by sovereign, sovereign wealth funds, um, um, liquidating positions to generate cash. So you have a lot of distressed sales in the market, which is also weighing on market level. Now, quickly, what we believe, um, we actually believe that China you know, we'll have a soft landing. We are not concerned fundamentally about Chinese growth, and I'm sure we'll come back to, to that. I'm sure Kuroda-san can comment on that more precisely. And the, the oil argument is all about, is this a demand issue or a supply issue? And a lot of people in the market believe that demand in China is decreasing, and that's really announcing a, a slowdown, a more pronounced slowdown of growth in China. Uh, we actually don't agree. There is very good evidence that uh, the net demand for oil has increased in 15, something like 1.2 uh, million barrels per day, and we think that half of that is China. So actually, the demand for China has increased. So it's a supply problem, um, not, a, not a demand problem, which is good news for the world economy. And we also believe that the low oil prices uh, are good for the world economy, good for the U.S. consumer, good for Europe, and good for over 5 billion uh, people on the planet who are basically uh, net importers or net consumers of, of oil. It's increased consumer, consumer purchasing power, and that's good for growth. But that's, that's a short answer. So the, to, just to summarize very briefly, your view, in a way, is that the markets have been overshooting rather significantly, and we shouldn't get too hysterical about it. Uh, I would say overreacting, and this is compounded by the structural decrease in liquidity, which we have observed in the markets. We know that the ticket size in many markets is lower because we banks as market makers adapting to a new regulatory environment are basically reduce our inventories and our ability to make markets. So for all of the things being equal, uh, the same news flow will trigger a, a bigger reaction in a low liquidity environment. Well, thank you very much for that very clear statement of where you think we are. So, Christine Lagarde, in that light of that, how do you see the global economic outlook over the next year, and how do you react to the judgments here of the major driving forces? Uh, thank you, Martin, and, and good morning to everyone. Um, we see global growth uh, in 2016 as being modest, and even, and with four downside risks. But it's up. I mean, we tend to forget that, as you said, Martin, from 3.1 in 2015, we see that 3.4 in 2016 and 3.6 in 2017. So they're factors that will actually increase uh, the global value of, of our economies. Now, let me focus on the, um, the four risks that we see on the horizon. Um, one is the, what I call the triple transition of the Chinese economy. And by triple transition, I mean moving from industry to service, from export to uh, domestic market, and from, um, I always tend to forget the third one, uh, so industry to service, export to domestic, and investment to, to consumption. consumption. Yeah. That's the triple transition that it's going through. It's a massive undertaking, and it's one where we forecasted uh, China to be at 6.8 in 2015, that's 6.9. 
So for those who pretend that they're very, very surprised about it, well, certainly it was expected. And we, we hope that the Chinese authorities will recognize the efforts that it takes to conduct those three transitions that they are determined to conduct, and that it will have an, an impact on the growth rate, and it will slow it down, which would be a good way to actually facilitate the transition and lower that first downside risk. The second downside risk is commodity prices, which have trended lower for the last five years, but where the lowering of prices have been accelerated, and certainly the perception of it has been accelerated in the last year and a half as a result of the oil prices, which is probably slightly uh, going to improve as demand seems to improve uh, a bit over the course of the last few months. To be seen, but still regarded as a downside risk. The third one is the asynchronous monetary policies conducted around the world, which entail quite a lot of flow of capitals uh, from emerging and low-income countries to advanced economies, particularly the United States, and which entail, combined with the lower commodity prices, a significant exchange rate impact by way of depreciation on some of the emerging market economies. Just a quick word on those emerging market economies, if I may, Martin. Mm -hmm. They are different. We used to talk of the BRICS. Uh, I think it's, it's not a, a fallacy, but the economic performance is vastly different, whether you look at India, which is cruising at 7.5% and seems to be thriving, uh, which is conducting some difficult reforms. Uh, China, which is gradually slowing down in hopefully a controlled way, with uh, financial markets, by the way, which are extremely minute relative to the size of the overall Chinese economy. Uh, Russia and Brazil, which for different reasons uh, are going to be in negative territory yet again this year. So, complete different picture from the emerging market economies, which I remind you were the big drivers of growth and had been for the last five years or so. So, the picture is changing. Um, but, you know, to be positive, uh, the things that we feared a year ago would never happen, which have happened. Financing for development was agreed in Addis Ababa about six months ago. The uh, Sustainable Development Goals were agreed in New York, which will entail significant change uh, in the economies and hopefully in the policy uh, decision-making, particularly in the low-income and emerging market economies, and COP21, which will also entail changes in our economies. So, um, modest optimism, but significant risks. Yep. Um, uh, the... Uh, it's interesting, you didn't emphasize at all what you think uh, might be happening in Europe. Are you just reasonably confident about the upswing there? Uh, Eurozone problems all resolved, as it were, Greek problem all resolved, and, uh, and we can just put that one to one side? Well, I felt that I was talking too much from your body language, so I stopped on, uh, on Europe. No, 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 but, uh, always uh, more, happy to have more, okay. within uh, reason. On Europe, uh, it's, the economy is certainly in a better shape. Our forecast for the, uh, for the Eurozone is 1.5, slightly lower than the, uh, the Euro uh, players themselves. We have two big concerns. Uh, one is uh, better discussed, I think, by, uh, by George, and that has to do with Brexit uh, and whether there is a deal to be had between the United Kingdom and uh, other members of the European Union, which we hope very much because it would really be conducive to more stability and a more cohesive economic zone. And the second is of a geopolitical nature. It's not directly economic, but it's uh, economically related somehow. It's the refugee crisis, which is a bit of a make or break from my personal perspective, not the perspective of the, of the IMF, because our IMF perspective on the refugee crisis is that if it is well handled, if the integration process is conducted uh, in a cohesive and organized way, in the short, medium term, is going to be an upside, and we figured that for the Eurozone, on average, it would be a plus 0.2% growth with uptick of up to 0.5% for countries like Germany or Sweden, which are the most likely to integrate refugees. Do you actually think, I um, can't resist it, that the ref this is obviously your personal view, but you've raised it, that the refugee crisis, because we heard a very similar view from Mark Rutter here just a few days ago, is sort of make or break for the survival of the whole Schengen area? You know, again, I speak uh, personally, not, as, not, not as MD of the IMF, uh, but yes, I think so. 
So, George Osborne, if I might turn to you, uh, how do you view Britain in the context of Europe and Europe in, uh, against this background? And could you talk a little bit more about this uh, uh, Brexit risk, which is certainly concerning people here very much? So we're, when we meet here a year from now, what are the chances that Britain will actually be in some sort of limbo and nobody knows where it's going to go? Well, I mean, Britain has been one of the uh, bright spots in quite a gloomy global economic uh, situation, and the IMF have us as one of the fastest growing of the advanced economies. Just had unemployment numbers a couple of days ago that show a record labor participation, the highest employment rate in our history, and, and low unemployment. And our sustained effort to uh, reduce the deficit has brought it down to close to a third of the 11% uh, deficit that I inherited in the job. So, you know, I think by following a clear economic plan, by taking some pretty difficult supply-side decisions, by uh, reducing government budgets, uh, we've given the UK a pretty secure footing going forward. But we're not people who have tried to duck the big issues facing our country's future. You know, we put to the ballot the future of the United Kingdom and, as a result, I think, uh, checked a move towards uh, the breakup of our country and uh, as a result, uh, and I'm very grateful for this, uh, and, and was pleased with the result, Scotland, Scotland is part of the UK. Now we've got another challenge, which is our membership of the European Union. Britain is the second largest economy in the EU, with the second largest contributor to uh, the EU budget. On many forecasts, by the 2030s, we'll be the largest economy in the European Union. But we are not in the Eurozone, and we're not in the Schengen area. And uh, so Britain has, uh, you know, in that sense, a different relationship with the European Union to other member states. And what we're seeking, I think, are improvements for all of Europe, not just for the UK. We're seeking a much more competitive European Union. I mean, I have sat on panels like this for the last five years where people have talked about free trade deals and completing the single market and so on. We need to put that into action. Uh, we need to, um, you know, as the Chinese proverb goes, talk does not cook rice. You know, we need to actually uh, get the thing done. And we are pushing our partners to agree to a much more competitive European Union so we provide jobs and rising living standards for people. Second, we want to address these concerns about migration. You know, you, you mentioned, Martin, the rise of uh, populist pressures around the world. You know, I think mainstream governments need to not ignore those pressures, uh, but actually address the legitimate concerns that can fuel them. And people in the United Kingdom, and not just in the United Kingdom, have concerns about the levels of migration. And our approach here, which is to say, by all means, travel to the UK to work and contribute to our economy, but just not to claim our, our welfare entitlements, I think is a reasonable approach. And I hope uh, my colleagues in the European Union agree. And then finally, you know, we have to resolve the fact uh, that the Eurozone uh, and uh, the uh, non-Euros need a better working uh, relationship. You know, the European treaties did not envisage a situation where large economies like the UK were not going to be part of this Eurozone. The Eurozone, in my view, although it's contested within the Eurozone, has got to follow this remorseless logic that is going to drive it towards ever closer political, economic, financial and fiscal union uh, and, uh, you know, this was the lesson that um, Alexander Hamilton taught us a couple of hundred years ago. And as they do that, Britain does not want to be part of that ever closer union. And, and we are therefore, and for me as a finance minister, this is the most significant part of our discussions with our colleagues, I think are going to find a much better resting place with proper protections and lasting arrangements so that a large non-Euro member uh, can coexist with the Eurozone. And those changes, I think, may uh, resolve this uncomfortable relationship that Britain has had with its European Union partners, where it's endlessly being asked to take part in further integration it doesn't want to be part of. And if we get that deal and we get that reform, we can put it to the British people uh, and we can recommend that we remain in that reformed European Union. Do you think there's 
I mean, in all seriousness, is there the slightest chance that you will get agreement on these huge issues in the next month or two that might also satisfy the immensely powerful, and we have to recognise, sceptical forces both in your party and in the country? Well, is this a, in, really in any way a realistic uh, project? Well, look, there are, of course, there are going to be people who definitely want to leave the European Union come what may. There were originally, and when we had our first referendum about our membership in the 1970s. And there are some people who've resolved, come what may, that we should stay in the EU. I, you know, I think the key group of people, and I think this is where the majority of British public opinion is, are people who, to use an old uh, campaigning slogan, want to be in Europe but not run by Europe. And these reforms are very significant for that. You know, the Prime Minister, myself, and the, and the government, if we can come back with a credible reform package, I think that will help make the case for staying in a reformed EU. And that's what we're working on. And look, there is goodwill out there uh, with the other member states and the institutions of the European Union. Uh, we've got to now make it happen. And, you know, I, I think the challenge for Europe, if I can put it like this, is, you know, the, in the end, uh, Europe, you know, sort of makes a decision sometimes at the 11th hour in a crisis because the Greek banks have to open on the Monday morning or the bond has to be, uh, you know, um, uh, repaid. Now, we as a, as a government, the British government, you know, we're not behaving like the Greek government. You know, we have, we have taken a much more, uh, I think, measured approach. You know, we've approached our colleagues as friends, partners and allies. And we've said, this is what we require. And I think in a mature and measured way, we can get that agreement potentially at the February economic, uh, the February European Council. If not, if it's not a good deal, we won't sign up then. But you know, there's an opportunity to do the deal then. And frankly, with lots of other things going on for the European Union, like uh, the, the challenges in the Schengen area, uh, I would say it's in their interest as well to, to give us the agreement that, I, as I say, I think works for everyone in the European Union. It's not a special. You know, it's not special pleading by Britain. This, I think, works for all EU member states. It's final, because it's such a big issue, and here's yes. this hall of people involved in business, many Europeans too, and many who have invested in Britain within Europe. Can you, from the base of what you know about what the negotiations are, the politics on which you are really an expert, could you tell them that you expect Britain still to be part of a reformed European Union a year from now? Well, look, I'm optimistic we're going to get a good deal for Britain and a good deal for the EU. And I think if, therefore, we can put that to the British people, uh, then the British people want to stay in a reformed EU. But, the, the, you know, this has, there is a sequence to this. And we've got to address totally legitimate British public concerns about migration pressures, about Britain being a part of an ever closer union, about our relationship with the uh, Eurozone, and above all, as a finance minister here at the uh, World Economic Forum, about our continent being a source of innovation and growth and jobs. You know, look at the history of our continent. It, you know, it has been the place that was the great source of scientific discovery, innovation, uh, brilliant business, and so on. I want it to be that in the future, and I don't want my continent to be priced out of the world economy. Uh, and if the British people see that we are delivering that change across Europe, uh, I think they will want to stay in that reformed EU. Well, let's turn, if I, we may, to uh, India, which is very much a bright spot from the world's point of view, uh, expected to grow 7.5%. Um, uh, the oil price fall would look like a tremendous boon to India, uh, a huge country on the uh, going well, with reforms underway, it all sounds a really wonderful picture. Many people would adore to have it. Do you have any problems? <laughs> Quite a lot. <laughs> so how do you see it? Uh, you see, I think our basic problem will have to be visualized that we still have a very large uh, section of population living in poverty. And therefore, we need uh, a high growth rate sustained over a long period of time. It's only then that we can get this segment out of poverty. Now, fortunately, in the last 13, 14 years, we've had reasonable uh, levels of growth rate, barring two years, and the bottom that we touched was around 5%. We haven't gone, gone ever below that. And uh, there is uh, an increasing realization in India that uh, given some favorable circumstances, our uh, 
actual potential could be somewhat slightly higher than this. For instance, this uh, 7, 7.5% 7 is in the face of uh, two continuous bad monsoons. And bad monsoons uh, adversely impact on growth because not only the share of agriculture goes down, but the purchasing power of 55% of people in India gets adversely affected. So at the moment, even when urban demand is high, rural demand is somewhat uh, uh, adversely impacted. So that's impacted slightly on the growth rate. Of course, the global situation, uh, 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 in one sense, the oil prices have been very helpful, but uh, 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 the shrinkage of exports uh, itself uh, is an adversity. And I think there is a there's a set of structural reforms which is in progress. And uh, there are a large number of steps which we've taken over the last year and a half. There are some in the pipeline. And uh, some of them are legislative and therefore, uh, in a very active and somewhat noisy democracy like India, to negotiate those uh, through parliament itself is a challenge. And therefore, if we are able to uh, do all this and given uh, uh, the rain gods being slightly kinder this year, I think uh, we can, in the coming year, improve upon uh, uh, this year's growth rate slightly. Can you tell us a little bit about, because there's been a long, big debate in India about whether you're reforming fast enough or uh, some disappointment with some people. Journalists are always disappointed, I understand this. It's easy for us. You have to pass it. But what do you think are the really high priority reforms that you must do and how much progress do you like to make? I know you have parliamentary problems. I, uh, or is it actually India's growth sort of guaranteed and solid at this rate, even if further reforms don't I, happen? I, I think uh, what's extremely important is that all steps that the government has taken have been significantly steps in one direction. We haven't made a mistake. We haven't reversed a direction. I think the second good news is that earlier it was the central government which used to push uh, reforms. Today, the regional governments, the states, have become extremely active. And irrespective of the political complexion of the party in power in those states, I think uh, uh, India's uh, cooperative federalism has transformed into competitive federalism. So the states are competing with each other. And I think that's, that's a very good news for India. Thirdly, most reforms are either through executive action or through budget announcements, uh, the nature of expenditure, etc. I don't think uh, uh, parliament in any way is able to obstruct that because the government has a comfortable majority to push them through. It's only one or two legislation, one in particular, which has been held up, which is the indirect tax reform, and that's very high on our priority. So I have immediately uh, three very important reforms in the pipeline. A direct tax reform where I'm bringing, uh, proposed to start bringing down uh, direct uh, taxation, corporate tax rates, uh, I think which should not be very difficult. Uh, 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 the indirect tax reform, which is the uh, uniform uh, uh, nature of the tax across the country, the goods and services tax, the lower house has passed it. Uh, I'm reasonably optimistic in the next session of uh, being able to push it through. And then we have the bankruptcy law, the insolvency law, which uh, uh, India didn't have an effective law, and which, which, which is easier because it only requires a simple majority in parliament to pass it. And therefore, besides this, most others are really through executive actions. There are, and I think what's one main reform, which is still work in progress, which governments across the country at all layers, the central government, the state government, the municipal bodies, I think it's the ease of doing business in India. Uh, we didn't have a, uh, a great track record on that. And I think over the last few years, uh, our rankings have improved, but it's still work in progress. So if I may turn to you now, Mr. Kuroda, in addition to addressing what actually is going on in Japan and what follows you know, QQE squared, or what are the next stage in your monetary policy, which I think you've increased the bank's balance sheet, your bank's balance sheet relative to GDP by about 40 percentage points, uh, which is quite impressive, which is more, after all, than the level for the ECB, the Bank of England, or the Bank of Japan, uh, bank, sorry, the Fed. So this is 
puts you in a class of your own, but you still suffer from low inflation. Mm. Uh, uh, amazingly stubborn, of course, and I don't just mean headline, also core. But I'd also be very interested if we could have it to the end, how far you agree with Tijan's assessment that we should not get too worried about the market turbulence, because inevitably many people are wondering, is the market, you know, uh, Paul Samuelson famously said the market forecast nine of the last five recessions, but maybe this is one of the five. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, since the turn of the year, as you know, global financial markets have continued to be volatile against the backdrop of heightened uncertainty, uh, such as over China's exchange rate policy and continued slide of oil prices. However, I do not share the pessimistic view about the global economy suggested by these developments in financial markets. For, for example, I don't think the Chinese economy will sharply slow down or will be faced with hard landing risk in the future. Rather, what we are observing in the Chinese economy can be regarded as the process of transforming itself from a investment-led and manufacturing-centered economy into a consumption-led and services-focused uh, economy. And uh, turning to Japan, uh, the economy is uh, likely to grow uh, by 1 to 1.5 percent uh, in the current uh, fiscal year, as well as in the next uh, fiscal year. The uh, corporate sector enjoys uh, historic high level of profit. And the labor market is uh, becoming tighter and tighter, uh, unemployment rate being uh, around 3%, which is basically full employment situation. Uh, however, the headline inflation rate uh, uh, has been around zero. Uh, largely because of substantially declined uh, oil prices. Uh, but if you look at the uh, inflation rate excluding fresh food and energy items, uh, then uh, the, this uh, underlying inflation rate uh, has been positive for 26 uh, consecutive months and has recently reached positive 1.2%. So uh, the economy uh, has been making a moderate recovery, and we will expect uh, uh, this kind of uh, 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 growth uh, will continue uh, uh, for some time. And uh, inflation rate, even headline inflation rate, uh, which is currently around zero, could uh, improve uh, substantially once uh, oil prices start to uh, bottom out. Of course, uh, the Bank of, Bank of Japan is uh, fully committed to achieving the price stability target of 2%, and uh, we will do whatever it takes to achieve that target as, uh, as, uh, as uh, at the earliest uh, stage. And uh, we do not think there's any limitation for our uh, policy tools uh, uh, to do so. Uh, as you uh, indicated, uh, the uh, balance sheet of the Bank of Japan has uh, significantly increased, uh, but as I said, uh, I don't think there's any uh, uh, technical or otherwise uh, limitation to further strengthen our uh, quantitative and qualitative monetary easing, if necessary, to achieve that 2% uh, inflation target. But you're not saying that right at the moment that you feel it's necessary? Uh, we have been uh, carefully watching uh, the market development, uh, as well as the real economic uh, development uh, in Japan and also in Asia. Uh, as I said uh, in my <coughs> uh, at, at the outset, uh, the 
financial market turmoil uh, uh, this month uh, have been, has been uh, somewhat uh, more than uh, anticipated. Uh, uh, and so we have been and we will continue to uh, carefully monitor uh, those uh, market developments and also continue to assess the potential impact of those market development on the real economy, uh, including growth rate and uh, unemployment rate, as well as uh, inflation rate. Now, one of the issues in the monetary sphere, uh, which I think Christine Lagarde mentioned, I'm pretty sure, is monetary policy divergence. Mm. So we've got a situation, you're easing, ECB seems yeah. pretty clearly is easing, Mark Carney's recent speech suggests the Bank of England is neutral and the Fed is tightening. Mm. And into this mix is a very uncertain situation. We have, even the Chinese officials admit, very badly communicated mm. about Chinese monetary policy and Chinese exchange rates. Mm. This, seems to be, this seems to be part of what markets are worrying about. Mm. Does this combination of events worry you or is it just a, a perfectly reasonable consequence of divergent situations among major economies? Quick answer is, uh, I think the divergence uh, uh, of monetary policies among uh, major economies, uh, I think, uh, is just reflecting divergent uh, economic and financial situations in those economies. As you mentioned, uh, Federal Reserve has already started uh, normalization of, uh, of monetary uh, conditions, while the ECB, uh, and, uh, and the Bank of Japan are likely to uh, maintain extremely accommodative monetary stance uh, for some time to come. Uh, these, I think, are uh, quite uh, natural and reasonable. By the way, uh, this asynchronized uh, <coughs> kind of uh, uh, monetary policy among major economies uh, could uh, uh, mitigate the, the, the impact of, uh, of, uh, of normalization of monetary policies by those uh, central banks. Because if uh, not only Federal Reserve, but also Bank of England, the ECB, as well as the Bank of Japan, all of them uh, started uh, to exit from the current uh, expansion in monetary policy at the same time, in a synchronized way, the impact on the global financial situation, particularly on uh, emerging economies and developing countries, could be uh, worse than the current staggered or asynchronized uh, sort of monetary uh, policy uh, making. Uh, second question is a bit different. Uh, Chinese uh, monetary policy, I think, uh, has been uh, quite appropriate, uh, being uh, accommodative uh, uh, because uh, uh, inflation rate uh, has been fairly low and uh, the economy is still growing but uh, slightly uh, uh, decelerating. And so uh, accommodative monetary stance is quite correct uh, in China. The issue is uh, uh, exchange rate and monetary conditions. And uh, I think uh, the Chinese authorities have been struggling in some sense uh, to avoid, on the one hand, excessive uh, depreciation or, or, or appreciation of its currency, but on, on the other hand, uh, they have to maintain accommodative monetary stance. So this is my personal view. <laughs> May not be shared by uh, the Chinese uh, authorities, but in this kind of uh, somewhat contradictory situation, capital control could uh, be uh, useful to uh, uh, manage exchange rate as well as uh, domestic monetary policy in a consistent and uh, appropriate way. Uh, that's uh, actually a question I wanted to ask Christine Lagarde, <laughs> so you got there. Um, 
So they lose, the Chinese authorities are losing reserves at a very remarkably rapid rate. There's a large capital outflow. Uh, they move to a new exchange rate system, um, and you've just put them in the SDR. Um, how would you feel about if they said, well, the only alternative to letting the exchange rate go, adjust downwards, uh, is to use up all our reserves we don't want to do, and the other alternative, well, one, that's one alternative, the other alternative is capital controls on out, tighter capital flows on, a temp, on the outflows on a temporary basis. How would the IMF react to these alternatives? Well, I, I think that the massive use of reserves would not be a particularly good idea. You can't do it forever, uh, No, anyway. that's they're, right. They're, they're Absolutely massive, right. Absolutely right. And some of it was used, uh, which leads me to another point, which is I believe that now that the quota and governance reform of the IMF has been ratified by the US, the size of the IMF is bigger, uh, which I think is the beginning of uh, a trend that should continue. The IMF should continue to be large in order to be seen as um, an international safety net that can be used and that can protect against such uh, shocks. So but that's an, an obje aside. Objective for the next term. Uh, <laughs> that's an objective for the IMF. You're absolutely right. right okay. um, <laughs> and on the other, you know, on the other issue, um, I think that some of the macroprudential measures that have been adopted in the last couple of weeks uh, were justified and are probably uh, useful in the context of, of the current um, monetary policy questions that the authorities have to ask themselves. Uh, that's point number one. Point number two, and I've gone public to say that uh, three days ago, you said they have changed the uh, exchange rate mechanism, and yes, they have. But I think that what is necessary for markets is clarity, certainty, uh, one message, and on that front, clarifying precisely how the exchange rate mechanism works and against which basket of currencies as opposed to the dollar, which is always the reference that is still made as far as the variation of the renminbi, would be a right move in the direction of setting expectations so that everybody knows that actually the pegging system that the Chinese authorities have used for the last 12 months or so has actually been the pegging against that basket of currency and in effective terms the renminbi has, has been quite stable. So the, whatever the policy might be, it really would help if we knew what it was. Yes. Uh, Clarity of message. Okay. I think actually that seems to be shared by Chinese policymakers again. I'd like to, to return now to Zhijian. We're very soon going to go to the audience. Uh, um, so you've heard about the environment as seen by the authorities. Uh, there are two sorts of criticisms in that I hear in... Uh, among market participants and commentators. You've already mentioned one, the regulatory effects on, uh, on liquidity. Um, the other is th this immensely long period of ultra easy monetary policy, which we've now had uh, since 2008, nine, is generating very significant financial sector risks, cumulatively. and. We should be concerned this year, that's one of the things, that some of these chickens might come home to roost. Perhaps in emerging economies, because so much capital flowed into them in response, so much money flowed into them, and now it's being pulled back. So, so the, the sort of monetary authorities are actually creating financial risk. And, uh, and the other concern, is indeed what I just talked about with Mr. Kuroda, that the, the divergence between authorities is also creating great financial stresses. Um, how far do, would you share this boat as either an observation or as a criticism of what the monetary authorities have been doing since the crisis began? Uh, yes, thank you, Martin. Um, I mean that. Um, the, um, the, the world has changed a lot since 2008 and banks have changed a lot. If you throw yourself back then, uh, we had huge balance sheets. We were highly leveraged. Um, and after a, a long period of um, asset price growth, uh, there was a kind of uh, excessive animal spirit, if I can describe it that way, an excessive risk taking. Uh, if you look at where we are today, and that's the good news. I want to start with the good news, really. I, I think, and I, 
Uh, I was teasing Mark Carney this morning, and I, I said I, I complimented him live on television, but I, I did. So for a, a bank CEO, that's a bit unusual. But I think that the FSB has actually done a very good job. Unprecedented, I think. Sorry? <laughs> Unprecedented. Unprecedented. Well, there you go. It's been done now. But I think the FSB actually has done a very good job uh, in terms of, um, in a way, forcing us to uh, strengthen our capital base. Because the one thing I haven't said in my introductory statement when you asked me about markets, there is absolutely no worry, no contagion risk about banks. Right? That has not come up in the debate. And that's a huge tick for uh, the regulatory system, the central banking system. Um, some of the numbers are really staggering. If you look um, at the, the total loss of absorbing capital that we're being asked to raise, I think the figure at the end of 19, ex-China, will be $4 trillion. So we collectively, the banks, will be holding $4 trillion of capital. That means that we can go through a stress event, we can go through a UBS, and this is not a, a dig at the competition, it's just a, a reminder of the past. We can go through, the, through a UBS, a city, and a Merrill, assuming we cannot raise capital and markets are closed, and we could continue to operate and fund the economy. So that's a big achievement, I think, for, for the economy, and we should take that now. On the, on the less positive side, yes, you have to deal with um, the divergence that, that Christine referred to, the asynchronicity of monetary policies across the big monetary zones. But I'm with um, Kuro Dasan on that. I think it's a bit unavoidable. Um, QE was an effective answer. I'm not saying the right, but only an effective answer to a major financial shock. And the exit of that is, I mean, there's already many articles written about it. The exit of that is quite a delicate phenomenon. And uh, frankly, um, um, it cannot come too early. So personally, personal view, I think that the normalization is, is necessary um, because I don't like periods where the, the price of risk is distorted for a long period of time. Because um, based on that, if you wish, distorted price of risk or risk-free rate, people take positions, make decisions, uh, to invest or not to invest, etc. You, you, you risk developing um, asset bubbles in various places, and really the exit of all that is delicate. But that's why I started the capital. The good news is, even if there is a degree of, I said trauma a few months ago, or commotion at the exit, the system can withstand it. And that's the fundamental message, so that uh, we can come out of this period and then look to, to a normalized environment um, with more serenity. I'm going to take about three or four questions together. Please say who you are, be very brief, so we can get, give people a chance to respond, and, uh, and uh, whether I will ask the question of the, of the panelists depends on whether I think it's a good question. Uh, so, uh, I'll start with the gentleman in the front, the front there. Yes, you, please stand up. Say who you are, and uh, very brief. It should work. This is Li Wei from Caixin. Question for Ms. Lagarde and Chancellor Osborne. Many would say you two made brave bets on China. Uh, given these market turmoil inside China and around the world recently, do you believe in your terms uh, your bet will come into fruition into good results? The, bra the great, what was the? Bet. 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 A great bet on China. Splendid. OK. Um, next question, immediately behind him. Paul Chief Standard and Paul Zimmer, Grohl Financial. The theme of this uh, Davos, of course, is the fourth industrial revolution. But when we think about policy frameworks, since the financial crisis, there have not been incredible revolutions. Certainly, some lessons have been made with macroprudential and microprudential policy. But I'd like to ask the panel if they think there is scope to revisit the major policy frameworks that we have in the world, monetary and fiscal policy, the relationship between those two in particular, but more generally, in the context of the fourth industrial revolution, do we need to revisit economic policy frameworks? That uh, sounds like a whole new session. Anybody right at the back? I'd like, there's, there's somebody, a lady behind, behind you. Yes, that's right. Please. Good morning. Uh, my name is Mariam Zhao. I'm a young global leader from Senegal. I would like to take this opportunity to say thank you, but also ask you just one very specific question. Can we make sure in 2016 we put a fund together where we could invest into young girls and women across Africa through technology, please? Thank I didn't you. quite get that because of the echoes. Could you, rep did you get? Investment in technology. I'm a young global leader from Africa. Senegal. Yeah, okay. I, would, I would like to ask Mrs. Lagarde and Mr. Tijan Cham 
and Mr. George Osborne. I live in London. I was wanting to know if they, we can put a fund together to invest into young women and girls across the world. Uh, I get that. Okay. And final question. Um, the lady there. Hi, I'm Summer from Tencent, the Chinese media. Uh, this forum is focused on the uh, Industrial 4.0. Do you think in this transformation, uh, developing countries and developed countries, the gap between them will be narrowing, or it's a new chance for the developing countries to ca uh, catch up? I'm going to actually start on the last, and I'll start with Mr. Jakeley. Um, do you think that the new technological opportunities being created by what's called the fourth industrial revolution. Um, particularly it's relevant to India, which has a strong IT sector, provides an opportunity to accelerate the catch up for, say, uh, an enormous and important country like India. Indeed it would be. And it would be for uh, several reasons. One of the reasons you've mentioned uh, 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 that Indians over the last uh, two and a half decades uh, took naturally to IT. This was one sector <clears throat> which in India never got regulated. And fortunately, because of that, uh, a lot of energies have been unleashed both within the country and outside. We saw the impact of this. The government didn't know and, it and, existed. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and recently, uh, I think uh, the startups uh, in India uh, and the new policy of the government also is intended to encourage that giving them tax break, organizing funding from that for them. And at the same time, the government maintains a distance, a no interference policy. Uh, 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 a large amount of relaxation from normal laws, et cetera, have been given. And we can actually see uh, uh, literally hundreds and thousands of them uh, uh, experimenting all over the country for innovations, uh, coming out with easier solutions. And I think in years to come, this is going to be a very powerful segment of Indian economy. Who would like to respond on this question of the technology fund and particularly in relationship to Africa? Uh, would you like to talk about that or yeah. George Osborne? We have a very large aid program. We are very interested in our role in development. I know, but so what is your perception on what can the uh, developed countries do? And I think there's actually a very particular issue which might be touched upon in this since we've just had COP21, this whole uh, climate change technologies, not just IT sort of thing, the role that the developed and other uh, countries and private institutions can play in getting these technologies into the developing world? Well, I mean, the United Kingdom is one of the few countries and the only large country that contributes 0.7% of its national income on international development. That's a decision we've taken even in a period uh, of very tight public budgets. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was a challenge bringing the British public with us, but a combination of the Ebola crisis in West Africa and the migration crisis across North Africa and the Middle East, I think actually is starting to make people aware in my country that if you try and tackle some of these problems at source, if you develop these economies, then people don't feel they need to move for economic opportunity and you uh, have longer life expectancy and rising living standards. Africa is an enormous economic opportunity, um, one of the, I would say, bright spots in the world economy. Uh, and uh, investment there in infrastructure and technology and the like, I think, pays huge dividends, not, not huge dividends, not just economic returns, but massive political returns. Does anyone? Have, uh, yes, yeah. please, of course. Just very quickly, uh, particularly given the fact that the, um, the young leader from Senegal has raised the issue of women and girls. Uh, you're right, Martin. COP21 was a big boost, but in countries like Senegal and very many other African countries, actually, it starts with power. And uh, there are multiple ways now and improved ways to obtain power, but it starts with power in Africa. And it takes me back to another point which has to do with stimulating demand, which everybody is crying for. Investing in infrastructure is actually a critical step towards setting more power sources uh, in African countries. On the funds for girls and... You mean and power as in electricity? Yes. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. Be clear. Um, <laughs> energy sources such as power. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and on, on specific funds for girls and women, they exist. Uh, 
I don't want to mention any name because they're generally privately owned and, and driven and governed. Uh, but I've heard a lot about the uh, IoT, IOV, which is Internet of Things, Internet of Values. I would hope that there is an IOW, Internet of Women, which can actually help with moving women in the direction of those funds that exist. Tijan. Yes, mostly I wanted to, to salute you because I, I was a global leader for tomorrow, class of 97. So from one, one to another, hello. So in a, a few years, uh, you a few will be years, up here years, on the platform. A few years, you're elder. Um, uh, and also just reinforce Christine's point that there are funds that exist. I won't mention name either, but there are funds that exist. Uh, absolutely back her on infrastructure, and, and I led the G20 panel on infrastructure. She was very supportive, absolutely vital for those countries. And make a final point, something I, I very much care about, which is um, the mobilization of domestic savings. Uh, the big hole in the strategies of development in the emerging countries is, and that's where maybe I'll differ with a young lady, I don't think the answer should come from London. Okay? There is a capital in Africa. It's an aberration that we don't have pension funds. Young countries should have pension funds. When you have a positive demography, it's the right time to put in place pension funds, and those should provide patient, long-term capital in local currency that can do all of those things. And uh, Mr. Kuroda, but comment incredibly briefly on this, yep. and then perhaps respond uh, to the question, why haven't we changed our monetary and fiscal frameworks mm -hmm. when we think everything else should yeah. change? I have intended to respond to the question related to policy framework. Yes. As Very you good. may know, uh, 2013, the government and the Bank of Japan agreed to a, a package of policies or policy framework uh, under which uh, monetary policy would uh, pursue uh, uh, to achieve 2% uh, price stability target at the earliest possible time. Uh, fiscal policy uh, should provide uh, necessary stimulus in the short run, but uh, must uh, 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 try to keep going. consolidate the fiscal um, we'll position in, in the medium to long run. And the third part is, of course, uh, various structural reforms, uh, including uh, uh, growth strategies, uh, deregulation, uh, free trade agreements, and so on and so forth. Uh, so this kind of uh, policy framework has been established, and uh, government and the central bank have been uh, uh, cooperating uh, to achieve uh, the, those uh, uh, policy uh, targets. Uh, Macroprudential measures, uh, the government uh, has uh, now uh, sufficient uh, uh, tools, uh, although at this stage the Japanese financial system is one of the soundest among developed countries, and we don't see any financial excess in the uh, financial sector. So at this stage we have not uh, utilized any of uh, macroprudential measures, but we have a lot of measures to be mobilized if necessary. Christian Guide, so you've got 30 seconds okay. on the great, also the great bet on China. All right. Uh, on and the, you'll on, have 10. On the policy frameworks, I won't address and the whole thing, but want. one thing I take away from this World Economic Forum, from the fourth uh, industrial revolution, is that there are lots of things that we don't measure, that we don't measure well, and I think we have to go back to GDP calculation of productivity, value of things, in order to actually assess and probably change the way we actually look at the, at the economy, and we, we will be working on that. On China, I've heard for the last 10 years that we are just about to see a hard landing. Everybody here on this panel tells you that we're not seeing a hard landing. We're seeing an evolution, a big transition, which is going to be bumpy, which will offer some turbulences. We have to get used to it, and it's a very normal and proper way to actually move towards a more sustainable and more quality growth, we all hope. George Osborne. No, on China, I mean, China's been a big theme of this whole week at Davos, and I would say this. In my lifetime, the biggest single instrument for ending poverty and making poverty history has been the growth of the Chinese and Indian economies. Uh, even China growing at this rate is going to add an economy the size of Germany to the world's economy by the end of this decade. Uh, and I think if I can end on a geopolitical point, the world has not been very good over previous centuries at accommodating rising powers, and it's often led to uh, unhappy outcomes. I think it is massively in our interests 
that we bring China into the multilateral institutions of the world. We reform the IMF, as Christine has done. Uh, we uh, bring their currency into the global markets. We support the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank and the like. It is hugely in our interest that China feels part of the global system and that that system works for them. Uh, and uh, so we must be in it for the long haul uh, as this extraordinary society grows and transforms. So I'm afraid I, I'm going to have to cut it short now. There's so many more issues. I want to talk about Greece and Ukraine and Russia and Nigeria and Brazil and the form of the monetary system. But I think the basic lesson is you shouldn't get too worried about what's going on in the markets. I tend to feel that's almost always true, except when it isn't. And it's very difficult to know at the time which it is, but I'm inclined to agree with the, the panelists. We've got some big issues out there and big divergences out there. Uh, the commodity collapse has hit some, a number of very important economies, the, the uh, very hard, think of Brazil, think of Russia. But we are reminded that basically, right at the moment, uh, the US, Europe, uh, China, India, even, Jap you know, increasingly Japan, look okay. And these are the core of the whole world economic system. And unless we are wrong about that, it should be all right. So cheer up. <laughs>